Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's story of events where we invite and highlight the stories of entrepreneurs and small business owners making their mark in Iowa. We want to remind you that as you create your own story, treat yourself to this time each month to rekindle your entrepreneurial spirit. My name is Sierra Ladroma. I am the project manager for the Iowa Center's Women's Business Center. The Iowa Center's Women's Business Center is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Administration. You will all receive an email after this event from my colleague, Ben Schultz, thanking you for attending today's session, information on how to connect to our speaker, as well as a form to complete. Please do us a big favor and take some time to fill this form out. This information allows us to continue providing free educational programming for small business owners in Iowa. Now go ahead and please take some time to locate the chat function on your Zoom screens so you can join the conversation by asking questions or adding comments. Today's story of guest is Megan McKay. Megan is the founder and owner of Peace Tree Brewing Company. Megan resides in Knoxville, Iowa and had an early career in technology and insurance. She created Peace Tree Brewing Company as a way to redevelop Main Street Knoxville by driving economic and cultural development in the community. The main production facility and tap room is located in Knoxville with a satellite tap room right here in the East Village of Des Moines. Megan is an entrepreneur at heart she is most proud of the way Peace Tree enriches the community through thoughtful beer experiences while upholding the values of authenticity, integrity, innovation, fun, tenacity, and family. Megan, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. How's it going over there in East Village? It's going fantastic. I've got, you know, a great view of the patio and the sun is shining on the Capitol Dome. And so, um, Spring is upon us. That's a, uh, we're all happy about that. Okay, so let's dive into it. How did, yeah, like, can you please share with us how Peace Tree Brewing Company came about? Yeah, absolutely. So I moved back home to my hometown in Knoxville in 2001 and joined my family's insurance agency as a fourth generation uh, business owner. And things were going fine, no problem. But in small towns, you know, there's always, um, a need to kind of redevelop buildings and those sorts of things. And, and a building came across across the street, came available and we were offered to buy it. And uh, we did so and didn't really know what we wanted to do with it. Uh, we thought about different ideas of what could go in there. And um, it was on Main Street, but it was about 5,000 square feet. So it was a little tough for like retail. Um, you know, office space didn't really feel great just because you kind of wanted something that would drive a little more traffic because we had such a nice location. Um, we talked about, you know, indoor storage or a laundromat or, and none of those things really hit the mark. And so finally, a couple years after holding onto this building, we just decided we would need to develop it ourselves because there wasn't a lot of creative thought around, um, you know, how to develop it. And my dad had read something in the Wall Street Journal about craft breweries. Mind you, this is about 2009, March of 2009. And, um, you know, there were craft breweries in the United States. There were about a thousand at that time, maybe 1500. Um, but it certainly wasn't what it was today. Um, and so we were kind of on the forefront of that. And when we looked at a craft brewery, it hit all the marks for us from the standpoint of, we could develop this building into a new use. Um, it would be a place where we could, you know, entertain our insurance clients. It would increase the quality of life in our community to provide, you know, a nice meeting space that people could get together over a quality beverage and, you know, meet and greet each other, which, you know, I, I think you kind of miss that in small towns. Sometimes there aren't a lot of spaces to do that. Uh, we really felt like it could be a place where we could draw tourism to our town. And uh, we made the choice to do a packaging brewery versus just a tap room because we also felt like because of our small population and just the makeup of our community, um, we would need an outside revenue source, you know, to bring back so that we could create the jobs and build the brewery to the size that we needed it to be in order to offer quality product um, and have the staff that we, we needed to have. So yeah, the brewery just kind of hit all the marks. Um, and that was March 2009. I think by the end of the month, once we decided that's what we wanted to do, we were incorporated in May. Um, Scott, my husband at the time, and I went to Boston to the Craft Brewers Conference to learn everything we could about beer and brewing. And um, I went to the Des Moines Public Library and bought every book I could on breweries and just the beer industry. 
um, hired our brewer in July. We had our tap room open in September with our first beers pouring uh, just off of a very small uh, scale system, just a, a you know practice system basically while we were waiting for the rest of the brewery to be built out. And by March of 2010, we had beer in kegs and in package and we were off and running. So um, that's kind of how it came to be. And I, I would love to tell you that we thought long and hard about it and really had a deep plan. But frankly, we just decided that's what we were doing. We knew what the end point was and off we went. So uh, that's how we got started. And then, um, you know, fast forward to today, we distribute all over Iowa and Nebraska. We both have uh, beer in bottles and cans as well as draft. And we have our two tap rooms in Knoxville and Des Moines. Um, I was able to buy out my partners in 2006 and transition away from the insurance agency. I sold out of that um, and I am the sole owner and this is my full-time job. I love how you were like, we decided on it this day and then by this day we were up and running. <laughs> yeah, it was literally like a year later. Um, mm -hmm. The interesting thing, my dad, uh, he's Catholic and had gone to church sometime in March and had seen that St. Joseph's Day is March 19th. And that is the traditional, um, he's the patron saint of workers and kind of the blessing of the Bach. And so we just said, okay, March 19th, 2010, that's when we're going to have our grand opening because that's like, you know, beer day. So we set a goal and we just made it happen. Met it. Yeah. So with that timeline that you set for yourself, what were some hiccups or barriers or before this, we even talked about self-doubt moments where you're like, no, this isn't going to stop this. We have to keep going. Yeah, I think, you know, there were a lot of things we didn't know. So uh, my background was kind of in operations HR. Um, I had some sales experience and, you know, just general business experience. My dad was obviously, you know, had owned his own business for many years with the insurance agency. Um, and had a lot of financial background. Scott was a graphic designer by education, um, also was in sales and had some background in construction, but none of us really were brewers. Um, Scott had homebrewed a little bit, but I would say, you know, the first obstacle we had was just, how are we gonna make great beer if none of us are brewers? So we set forward and found Joe Kestelut, who's been with us since the beginning to be our, um, you know, our brewmaster and make sure that we were providing the best quality liquid that we could because that was really important. From there, I think we just started to learn all the things that we didn't know we didn't know. Um, you know, when you're selling insurance, it's not really a physical product, you're selling a policy, whereas now we're going into manufacturing basically. So we had to learn how to procure six packs and machinery and bottles and ingredients and, you um, start learning how to manage inventory. I think, you know, the other thing was we had done a little bit of construction projects. We'd built out some apartments and that sort of thing, but building out a brewery facility was much more complicated. And we probably didn't have um, the depth of construction people that we needed. And so, you know, there was a huge delay putting our glycol system in because we just didn't have the trades in Knoxville to know how to do that. And um, you know, probably in hindsight should have pulled from a company that really specialized in that, but we just, you know, looked locally and, and used what we had. So some of those kind of hiccups, I think it's just, you know, ferreting out where, where your holes are and mm -hmm. learning what you don't know so that you can either figure it out or, or a partner or hire someone who, who can do that for you. Um, sure. Kind of the funniest um, misstep. So I said we had beer in packages in March of 2010 we didn't realize that it was about an eight week lead time to get six pack carriers. And so we had beer, we had bottles, we had labels, we had everything, we were ready to go, but we had no six pack carriers. Um, and so I just kind of said, well, the beer has to go out, like it's time to do this. So we had like brown craft paper bags with the little handles yep. and we just slapped labels on them, put six beers in each bag, put them in the case box. Uh, we were self-distributing at the time, so we just took them out to grocery stores and, and places and asked if they would sell our beer in these brown paper bags, and it was really terrible. You know, looking back, it's like, what a dumb way to go to market, but at the same time, um, people remembered that, and they were like, what is this new thing, and where is this coming from, and it's, it's not in a six-pack carrier like everybody else, and uh, so, you know, we kind of got some buzz, and I think we turned you know, lemons into lemonade with that one. And even when we got distributors, you know, they kind of had remembered that and, and it had 
struck a chord with them. Like, man, who are these people? They're like taking shelf space away from us with these brown paper bags. So um, yeah, there were a lot of crazy missteps, but I think that one's always kind of fun because it's like, even though it was terrible, it, it actually worked in our favor. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's honestly- Mindset. Yeah, for real. And finding a different opportunity within something that maybe is a barrier. But I, I love that because I feel- that if you showed up somewhere with a paper bag with some beer in it, people would be like, yeah, I'm into this. Like that would almost be a trend. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was just, it was like, oh, they're, they're young, they're new. Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's not some big company pretending to be a small craft company and acting like they're local. It was, it made us very authentic. So that was great. Yeah. I love that so much. All right. So you've talked about being in retailers uh, and knowing that you weren't just going to be a tap room, but in order to create revenue and just grow, you wanted to be on shelves too. So right. there are a lot of entrepreneurs here who have that essential goal of, I have this product, but I want to be more than my retail store. I want to be in other retail stores. So um, with that, Peace Tree can be found in so many places. Can you share with us how you started reaching out to different retailers to say, this is what we have, it's great, and it needs to be on your shelves? Yeah, I, and again, like that was one of those things we didn't really know or understand. The beer world is very, um, it's highly regulated. You have to go through distributors. There's a three-tier system. Uh, fortunately for Iowa craft brewers, if you're a native brewery, which is a separate kind of license, you can self-distribute. And so we started thinking about it from, who are the influencers or who are the people who could maybe, you know, have the key to the lock that we're trying to open. Um, mm -hmm. One of those targets for us back in 2010 was John's Grocery over in Iowa City. Um, yes. John's Grocery, if you're not familiar, is a small corner grocery store in Iowa City. They specialize in, especially at that time, import beers. Um, we didn't have a huge craft scene yet, um, but they were known as the beer guys. You know, they were the ones that you would go to to learn about any new beers that were coming into Iowa, they really had a specialty there. And so we said, if we're gonna sell beer in Iowa, we've got to make sure that John's Grocery A thinks our product is good because if they don't think our product's good, we're not gonna sell it anywhere else. Um, you know, They're the ones that kind of were the bellwether of telling people what was coming and what was around. Um, and so we tried to find people like that that could help kind of get our foot in the door. Um, so, you know, that was kind of big picture standpoint and that worked because then they told, you know, bars and restaurants in Iowa City about us. Um, and then, you know, it started to kind of catch on from there. Des Moines was a little harder. We didn't have much of a craft beer scene in Des Moines. Um, but again, we just tried to kind of find like the high V's maybe that had a wine and spirits manager who was, uh, had a bigger craft section or was into that and, you know, get mm -hmm. your foot in the door there so that then you could, you know, start seeing that product turn on the shelf a little bit and then it would spread from there. And then of course we used our tap room as our, um, I always kind of called it our dealership showroom. Um, mm -hmm. People were excited to come and visit and try something new and we could really showcase it well there and then remind them where they could go find it out and about. Um, but beyond that, from a really practical standpoint, we had, um, a brewer and we had two gentlemen who helped us package. And so they would brew, package and then maybe on Wednesday one of them would get in a truck and drive the beer around and drop it off to the retail stores who wanted it or bars and restaurants and then they would also go and make a couple of deliveries of samples um, and kind of talk to a couple of accounts so we really combined that whole like production distribution sales function into a couple people um, yeah. which was great because accounts were super excited to hear from somebody who actually had a hand in making or packaging the beer um, and then was out actually talking about it. So it was just a lot of, you know, just pull your boots up and get out there on the ground and get going, um, which I think is the way it works for most small businesses. You know, yeah. there, there's no way around just going out, talking about your product, putting mm -hmm. it in front of people, having them see it, try it, feel it. Um, it's hard. It takes a long time, but that's what you have to do. Yeah. I know it's not always the case, but it's always, it's always just a type of special where you, your product is dropped off by the owner or the person who created it. I love that. Um, yeah. okay. So a question that came in is, can you talk about the process of establishing the East Village location? What were some of the successes and what went into planning this move? Yeah, so the East Village location really came about, um, like I said, I 
transitioned out of the insurance business and I decided to make the move for this to be my full-time job that um, hopefully would support myself and my son. Um, as I you know, look at putting him through college and retiring someday. Uh, and I started looking at our business and it was like, okay, how can I grow this business so that it can accommodate me? Because we had never taken paychecks as owners from the business until that point. And all of a sudden I'm adding another, you know, payroll. Um, so how can I grow it? And we could grow distribution, but it also takes some investment to be able to do that. Um, and so then I was like, well, how can I grow cash flow? And how can we be more um present in the Des Moines market. Cause I think the other thing we saw was in Knoxville, people would drive down there at first. And then as more breweries came into the Des Moines market, um, we started to be seen as more of a rural brewery or somebody who was outside of town. So for both of those reasons, actually there was a third reason too, which was to be able to kind of brew sours and do some different things. So we started looking at Des Moines because again, you know, your revenue, uh, your margins are better in a tap room. Um, we wanted to be closer to the population center of Iowa. And then we wanted to be able to do that, um, the sour beers and have a different facility for that. And then we thought, you know, with the tap room uh, margin growth, we could use that to invest back into production so that we could continue to grow the wholesale and distribution side. So that's really how that came about. Um, specifically with the East Village, we looked at several locations um, you know, nothing against West Des Moines, but that just wasn't a good fit for us from a, a geographic perspective. And then also, I think just culturally, we wanted somewhere that was a little more city centered downtown. That's kind of our roots. Um, mm -hmm. And the East Village was really just um, captured our hearts. I think there's a lot of growth and a lot of exciting things happen down here. There's, you know, a little more diversity on this side of town. Um, it's you know developing and I, there's just kind of an arts and culture and and fun piece to it that was really attractive to us and fit with our our company culture i absolutely love the east village location i also think you have a prime location right like right in the east village um yeah. so i i love that um so we meant or you mentioned a little bit about how the craft beer industry and especially here in the, the des moines area wasn't really a thing back then um what do you think caused the trend what what happened for it to be like yes craft beer yes i'm gonna go hang out at a brewery i think a few things i mean i think it was a trend in other like it was starting to become a trend in other places and we've had a few of those you know you kind of saw in the 80s um you saw brew pubs kind of come on line and then that bubble burst a little bit. And then you saw that happen again a little bit in the nineties. Um, and I think it's just, you know, it's always hard to get going. There's a lot of competition with the big guys. Um, and I think finally this time, like as brewers, we figured out how to kind of overcome that. And I also think it was a little bit of a perfect storm of people really are gravitating toward local products, um, not just yes. in beer, but in, you know, vegetables, in meat, in, uh, you know, anything that they're eating or drinking, they're looking for locally produced products. And the third piece of it is, I think people just, again, kind of wanted that gathering spaces and breweries kind of started to figure out like they didn't have to be a full restaurant type thing, but they're really not also a bar. And it just kind of hit this intersection of a spot where um, people could very comfortably meet, drink a really good beverage, and it, it, they just became, to me, they're always kind of the epicenter of like art and culture. You know, if you want to yeah. go to a new town and figure out what's going on, go to the brewery, talk to the bartenders, you're going to learn about great food, you're going to learn about music, you're going to learn about art, um, and mm -hmm. you're going to get to drink some good beer and meet cool people all at the same time. And so I, I just feel like breweries in general have um, filled a need that the world needed. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's yeah. most what I'd say about that. But I I love that, and I and I'm. It, it's always interesting to me because a couple years ago, it kind of started the trend of like, hey, do you want to go to the brewery and work on like do work, or uh -huh. just like it wasn't straight up just do you want to drink? It was do you want to work on something? Do you want to have a board game night? Do you want to have? It was a whole array of social and like professional things to do at breweries because you provided the space. Um, exactly. And it was just a gathering. I, I think that has been a giant trend. 
and I think it, it's kind of extension of like the coffee culture. Um, it's just sometimes, you know, like you can only drink coffee so long during the day, at least I can. I mean, I could drink coffee all day. I just wouldn't sleep at night, but um, it's kind of that coffee shop culture. Uh, so it's, it just takes that and then extends it into the afternoon and evening where it's, again, just a place to meet, work, learn about new things um, and, you know, have great beverages as well. So one of the questions or a couple of the questions that came in, um, one is from Annalise. Can you talk more about going to market? How do you know when you're ready, even if not every detail is in place? I guess it kind of goes back to the bag conversation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you just have to, you know, for us, we knew we were going to go to market. That was the whole goal of it. Um, I think as I've seen a lot of other smaller breweries come online or maybe some other small businesses, they might start with just a tap room or just a retail space and then start to expand into online or expand into more retail spaces. So um, it's a little bit of a choice for everybody, you know, depending on the makeup of their business and how they're doing it. For us, you know, again, it was just a matter of, we knew we were building out production space. We knew that we couldn't have just a tap room in Knoxville, Iowa and support the amount of infrastructure we needed to put into brew beer. Um, so from day one, that was always our goal was to get into distribution and wholesale sales. As far as like going into new markets, um, you know, that's something we've done sometimes, sometimes with some success, sometimes not. Uh, for instance, we went into Minnesota, we went into Kansas, um, and that was back in the day when you could kind of just throw beer at a distributor and they would go out and sell it. Um, we really didn't have the support system we needed to uh, have salespeople to support our brands in those markets, and we've since pulled back, which is fine. We've grown in Iowa, which I think is what we probably should have done in the first place. But um, again, it's just kind of looking at, and I think it's really hard when you start because your production will be big and you won't have the sales, or then you'll have a bunch of sales, but you won't have the production. And so it's finding that balance between the two. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's both of those things. One, what are your ultimate goals? when you start or as you're doing your planning. And then number two is, you know, what kind of production do you need support and where where do you need to sell to be able to support that production and vice versa? Yeah, okay. Another question that came in is, as the craft brew market expands across the states, how do, or how do you manage your relationships with your competitors? Yeah, it's, you know, it's really interesting. So the craft beer world, when we started, um, there were maybe 25 breweries in Iowa, uh, maybe only two or three of them were packaging. Today, there's over 125 breweries. And it's frankly, it's a little sad to me, like it's hard to get in touch with everybody and hang out like we used to. Um, I would say in the beginning, you know, it was Do really- Do you mean like, like with everybody as in your competitors? Yeah. Like, yeah, okay. you know, in the beginning, we all hung out together. We're all friends. And, yeah. you know, there were all kinds of hijinks that were happening uh, when we would get together at beer festivals and, you know, we'd loan each other a bag of grain or somebody else would need bottles or, you know, just whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think especially within the brewers. So if you look at like the business, so in the technical brewing space and the artistic creative space, those guys still really talk to each other and share information back and forth. Um, and it's, it's a very fraternal you know, group, which is really cool, more than I've seen in any other industry that I've ever been in. So competitors is always an interesting term. Um, you know, as we've grown, and I think as everybody gets salespeople or you know, we get more on the business side, then you know, your sales arms aren't always the soft, warm, fuzzy, like, hey, let's hang out and drink beer together. They're like, no, I want to take your handles or I want your shelf space. Yeah. Um, but I still think we all manage that pretty well. Um, you know, we have the Iowa Brewers Guild where we collaboratively work together to market Iowa beer. I think we're a lot stronger together than we are if we're all doing our own thing. There's still a lot of education. Um, I haven't looked at the latest numbers but, you know, of all the beer sold in Iowa, maybe 5% of it is made in Iowa. Um, there's 95% of that market that we're not capturing as Iowa breweries. So you can call us competitors with each other, but I think the bigger piece of the pie that we're competing against is still out-of-state breweries, large breweries, uh, wine, liquor, et cetera. Um, and I, I think we have to work hard as an industry to keep that in the forefront. The other thing that we really do collectively is lobby. Um, like I said, in the beginning, we're a very highly regulated industry. We have 
a lot of um, rules that are placed on us legislatively. And, you know, there's a lot of things like wholesalers or retailers in the other tiers would like to make sure that, you know, we're kind of kept in our spot so that um, the balance of power stays how it is. And we, we tend to have to work hard to overcome that. So, um, you know, as far as managing relationships with competitors, I think that's just it, is you have to find your common ground. You have to find where you can lift each other up. Um, and I'm a big believer in if we can raise the tide, it's gonna lift all the boats. And, you know, sometimes, somebody else is going to benefit a little bit more and sometimes it's going to be our turn but at the end of the day we're kind of all in this together in some ways um and i hope that we can keep it going that way i think i think we do a really good job as an industry of doing that i really enjoy hearing that yes they are your competitors but honestly it's your community of resource and, and your friends yeah i think that's one yeah. big thing that holds people back um when it comes to I don't know, it's just thinking like, oh, they might take someone's customers away or this person's yeah. better in a certain way or something like that. So I think that's really yeah. great for entrepreneurs to hear that competitors aren't necessarily a threat. Um, you're all bringing yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, you all have to figure out where you're adding value. And, you know, hopefully the thing that makes you cool and interesting is different than what makes, even though you're in the same industry or you're selling a similar product, you all have to differentiate and you all have to, you know, innovate and find the thing that makes you unique and, and people want to buy you. And that doesn't necessarily mean the guy down the road is bad or wrong or goes out of business. Uh, you know, hopefully you can both, both be successful. Yeah. Another question that we had come in is talking about local. One of the things you mentioned was wanting to create a space to bring the community together and hang out. What are some things you've done to make Peace Tree a part of East Village and that community? Yeah, I think um, as you were kind of asking me about opening the East Village, the next question sometimes is how is that different than Knoxville? And I think um, it's a little different in Des Moines than it is in Knoxville. Uh, you know, in Knoxville, we are a community space because there's not a lot of one. In Des Moines, I think it's a little harder because there's so much stuff going on up here. and. Um, so how do we keep carving out that niche and, and offering up something that's valuable to the neighborhood? You know, when we opened four years ago, there wasn't a lot of residential in this neighborhood. It was more just people coming here for uh, retail and entertainment, maybe, you know, a few office buildings around. Um, so I think that's still evolving for us, but we try to do things like we're part of the historic East Village business group. Um, and so when they have like promenade or other, you know, general neighborhood things, uh, we always are involved in that. We've done different things like during um, shopping times, you know, if somebody brings a receipt from one of the local businesses, you know, that they went shopping there, we'll give them a discount on their beer just to kind of help promote our neighborhood and each other and support each other. Um, you know, we've been very active in Pride Month. Uh, we're, you know, fortunate to be right down the street from the garden and Blazing Saddles is right up the road. And I think just, you know, showcasing that as part of our neighborhood and being part of that community has been really cool. Um, I think there's always more we can do. Um, and, you know, this last year, I'm probably off my game on that a little bit, especially just because of COVID. It's been really hard to engage people to come into the tap rooms as much, but we're starting to get back to that. Um, I guess one other thing we do that has been really fun are uh, fundraiser Fridays. And we try to bring in a different group uh, once a month. We let them set up a table, talk about you know, do they have volunteer activities? Are they looking to raise funds or, you know, just talk about the services that they offer to the community. And then we um, donate a portion of that, that night's sales to that organization. And, you know, it's, it's not like a ton of money that's gonna make or break their organization, but I think between that and the maybe access to our customer base and just a different group of people um, has always been really helpful. It's just elevating their story and, and what they're doing too. So yeah, we're always open to, um, collaborating whenever we can and, and yeah. doing things, it's, uh, it, it morphs all the time. Yes, I, I think that's the overall mindset of a lot of small business owners of we want to work with you, we want to collaborate, we want to yeah. grow our community, that's the entire purpose. Um, so a couple more questions came in uh, about beer names, but I do want to ask you, how did you come about naming it Peace Tree Brewing? Yeah, so Peace Tree is... Um, so down in Knoxville, we're close to Lake Red Rock and the town of Red Rock used to be where Lake Red Rock is. 
Um, and before that, even, there was a large sycamore tree that was uh, either the largest or second largest sycamore tree in the United States. And it was a place where the Native Americans would meet and trade furs. Um, you know, they would uh, tell stories and kind of talk about, you know, settling further and, and those sorts of things. And then when the uh, settlers came through, that also was a meeting spot. At one point, that tree was the marker of the Red Rock Line, which is how far the Native Americans could go west. And then um, a couple years later, they were able to go settle there. And that tree was part of the, the demarcation line of, of that Red Rock Line. Um, I grew up right on the banks of Lake Red Rock. So the dam came in in 1969 and flooded all of that out. The town, everything was taken out of there. My family had um, farmland down there and, and that was, you know, they moved into Knoxville at that point. Um, but that tree, they didn't clear it out. The lake was supposed to take about six months to fill up or a year and it took about six weeks. So there was stuff that didn't get cleared that stayed kind of under the water. And that tree was one of them. It was uh, dead at that point, but the, you know, as the lake rises and falls, that tree would be visible or not visible. And so um, it just was always known as the peace tree or the treaty tree, just from that long history of, of being a meeting spot. And so when we were trying to come up with a brewery name, it just felt like a great, a great reminder of our history, a great reminder of kind of where cultures came together. You know, it's, I'm not sure that's always the best, most proudest part of American history, but at least, you know, it's kind of cool to highlight that and just remember that things change and, you know, honor where we came from. Um, and then of course, just, you know, strong personal ties. That's where my mom grew up, was in the town of Red Rock before the dam was in. And so um, it's just been a really fun um, way to, you know, again, kind of honor our geography and our history and kind of have that mindset of a place that brings people together to talk and make agreements and, um, you know, hash through things. So the peace tree, there it is. Thank you for sharing. Sorry. And uh, I will say the tree, it, it was in the lake. We actually had taken boats out to it. And I have pictures of all of us, you know, hanging out with the tree. Um, unfortunately, a log ice jam got it uh, about three years ago and it floated down the river. And uh, the marina guys went out and got it, attached it to a boat. And it took them like, I don't know, hours. Uh, they were going like one mile an hour and they drug it into the marina. So it's actually sitting in the marina parking lot at Lake Red Rock and you can go see it, but it's it's a huge tree, it's pretty cool. Okay, thank you for that. So let's talk about the beer names. Your beer names are yep. great. How do you come up with them and tell us more about the Alter Ego um, War Tree? I guess you already- War Tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so beer names are always interesting. Again, that's kind of one of those things with the growth of the industry that's gotten harder and harder as we go because there's only so many words in the English language that you can name a beer and holy cow, there's a lot of beers out there these days. Um, but again, kind of like with the name of our business, we try to have some meaning or some story or something that resonates with us, um, which sometimes doesn't always resonate with customers. But um, I think when you have something you can attach it to, it, it makes a lot more sense than just coming up with something that sounds good. Um, so like Blonde Fatale, uh, when we opened in 2010, by state law, we could not brew anything over 6.25% ABV. So all of the beers brewed in Iowa had to be less than 6.25%. Um, Joe decided the law changed uh, later that spring. And um, he's like, I'm gonna brew a Belgian style strong ale. And uh, I think this is gonna be a great beer. And of course me being as dumb as I am, sometimes I'm like, I don't, who's gonna drink an eight and a half percent Belgian strong ale? Like this is ridiculous. Uh, so we tapped it, we had an event that night. Um, it was really fun. We all went out and did this thing. And then we came back to the tap room and it was like, man, it was super loud in there. Everybody's faces were really red. And uh, one of our bartenders the next day, he was like, that beer is killer, man. It's like, you gotta be careful with that. I think you should name it Blonde Fatale, you know, like Femme Fatale. And so just one of our bartenders named it and it was just like, then it was just a funny, super great name. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. uh, we ended up winning a world beer cup with that. Um, with that beer, which really catapulted it kind of to the top. So that was where Blonde Fatale came from. Uh, Red Rambler is actually the brewery. Uh, the original brewery in Knoxville was an old uh, Nash Rambler car dealership. So uh, we just wanted to kind of, again, give a nod to the history of the building um, being a Rambler car dealership and it was a red ale. So Red Rambler is, is where that came from. 
Um, you know, some other ones that are significant. We have East Village IPA, uh, obviously, for the East Village, um, kind of our love letter to this neighborhood. Um, today, uh, actually yesterday, we just sent out Lake Loop uh, Pale Ale, which is a brand new beer that we came up with. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we would scoop the loop in Knoxville as people do in a lot of small towns. And, uh, you know, when you wanted to spend a little more time with somebody or um, maybe you wanted to drink some beer while you were out driving around, which I know is totally illegal. We never did that, but um, we would go on a lake loop. And so you would go out around Lake Le Red, Red, Red Rock. Um, it would take about half an hour or so. And so that was always called a lake loop. So this idea of this beer was just kind of like, you know, take the long way around, get together with friends. Um, you know, it really evokes like the lake and it's got a like, lot of nice tropical and summery notes to it. And so Lake Loop is where the name of that came in. And it's really funny. I put it out on Facebook yesterday with my hometown and I hadn't talked to a lot of people about it. As soon as I put the beer up, um, everybody's like, oh man, we need a t-shirt. Oh, Lake Loops, those were so fun. We should do a Lake Loop again, you know? So it was just really resonated with my hometown. Hopefully it will with, with people out and about too. But that's usually where the beer names come from. We sit around and drink beer and talk about the feeling we want to get from that beer and then tie yeah. it to something within our history. The Lake Loop name is so great because you're bottling memories for people. It, yeah, it's, for sure. it's incredible. Um, okay, so I know you're in the tap room right now and I'm seeing customers go back and forth, um, <laughs> which I love. And they some of them are wearing masks. Can you talk to us about how Peace Tree Brewing and, and your team kind of pivoted to make sure that you can continue running, continue providing uh, basically products to during the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. You know, this last year has been really rough for us. Um, really interesting to kind of manage through all of that. So last March, we were getting ready to celebrate our 10th anniversary. We had spent pretty much the whole year planning what we were going to do for our 10th anniversary party, which was scheduled to be March, I think 21st was the Saturday. Um, and as we were getting closer to that March 21st date and that 10th anniversary, it was becoming very clear that this pandemic was taking hold and we really needed to think about how we were gonna do things. Um, I feel really fortunate. I sit on our hospital board and had reached out to our CEO at the hospital and the, one of the uh, lead physicians to just kind of ask their advice on what we should do. So we actually, um, before the governor closed us down on March 17th, we'd actually gone ahead and decided to um, postpone our anniversary celebration. Uh, we made the choice to go ahead and close our tap rooms to the public the Monday before. Um, and then of course the governor's order came through. And at that time, um, to me, the number one thing was how do we preserve Peace Tree? How do we make sure that we have a company to come back to? Um, and I think, you know, sometimes that's not always the mindset. I, some people would say, take care of your employees first. And I was like, my employees are really important to me, but if I don't have a company for them to come back to, or if I don't have revenue and cash flow, I can't take care of them long-term. I mean, I could do something short-term, but my goal was to really think about it from a long-term perspective. So we pivoted as quickly as we could. We actually switched to like square online sales so we could do a little better job of online sales, pre-orders. Um, people could come and pick beer up. Um, we could do curbside pickup. You know, we still have some work to do with that. It's not the smoothest uh, website thing, but it works. Um, we tried to do a lot of things like partnering with local food companies so you could come and pick up some beer and get some food and just you know have quick curbside safe way to pick that up while we were closed um and you know just manage through it that way as much as we could once we were able to reopen we really again looked at okay long term what's the best choice for us and it was like how do we keep our employees safe um how do we keep our customers safe so that they can continue to come back um We've required masks uh, in our tap rooms, I don't know, since June or July. Uh, mm -hmm. We're continuing to do that now. We still have our tables fairly well spaced apart. Um, so we're not at full capacity. We're doing extra cleaning. Um, up here, we keep the fans going. We have pretty good ventilation. Same thing in Knoxville. You know, Just trying to do everything we can to keep our staff and our customers safe. Um, and then of course, from a production standpoint, we really shifted to more packaged products. Uh, we had a lot of beer that was ready to go and draft out to bars and restaurants last year that obviously um, bars and restaurants were open. So we 
quickly repackaged that into um, six packs. We had like some leftover different old brand six packs. Uh, we just repurposed those and we went really, you know, <laughs> we went really old school, kind of the same thing with the stupid brown paper bags. Um, we just got stickers for the caps of the beer. And, you know, cause they weren't beers we had labels for. It takes three to four weeks to get labels. Mm -hmm. um, so we just printed our own little stickers, put them on the caps with what the beer was and sold six packs of things. It like works. Bakery, no post, cherry goza. Oh. Um, we, yeah, just basically transition that. And then of course, you know, longer term this year, we've done a lot more package product. Our grocery sales are good, uh, bar sales are not. And so, you know, we just kind of manage uh, inventory that way as well. But yeah, it'll be interesting to get through. We are fortunate, quite a few of our bartenders are teachers. Um, so they've been vaccinated. I'm hoping the rest of them, you know, whoever wants it can have that happen here pretty soon. And then we'll continue to just kind of monitor and make good choices so we can be safe and be here for the long term. But yeah, we definitely had to pull back some staff. Um, we had to make some hard choices um, that way, which was not fun. But uh, again, kind of keeping that idea of I've got to have peace tree be whole. I've got to have that survive because that's the only way I'm going to be able to protect our core and keep our employees long-term and have a company to come back to. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about your team. So a question that comes in is, what advice do you have to entrepreneurs who are looking to grow their teams? Uh, yeah. yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, I think that's a great question and it's a really hard one um, because, you know, you always feel like, oh man, I, there's just not enough time in the day and I need all these people to do these things, but there's just no cash to actually go out and hire the people that you need. Um, and sometimes you can make a hire, but maybe you can't hire at the level that you really need because of, again, just you're not at that point where you can afford it. Um, what I always try to do is uh, you know, for myself as the owner is I, I just play that position role where, um, okay, wherever I feel like we're struggling, that's where I put my focus and energy, um, and then try to backfill with staff for the other pieces. And then once you kind of get one thing stabilized and where it needs to be, then you can go and put your energy towards somewhere else. And then hopefully, I think what I've found too, is over the years, you can kind of start to figure out how to make things more efficient too. So maybe you can realign staff and maybe realize that you only need one person instead of two and you can move them over those sorts of things. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's just about really defining, and we didn't do this very well in the beginning because we just started and, and went, you know, started going. But three years ago, um, I was introduced to a book called Traction for the Entrepreneurial Operating System uh, by Gino Wickman. And we really put that whole process in place. And it's been very helpful to identify kind of our big um, picture goals, our long-term mission. It really forces you to get an accountability chart, which sounds very corporate and icky, but it's actually super great because if people know what they're responsible for and where their area is, then you, know, you can really start to delegate and hand things off. And I will tell you, I am a terrible delegator. I'm kind of a control freak and I like to have my hands and everything. Um, so this has been really good for me to A, be able to define for people what they need to do, um, define for myself what the areas of the business should be. And then that way you can have a really clear picture of what type of person you should hire, what kind of things they need to be responsible for, and then you know back up and let them do that so that you can go on and, and fill the other holes. But um, you know, I, at this point, I could tell you there's like about five full-time positions I would love to hire, but it's just not going to happen anytime soon. So, you know, again, pick the one that's going to make the most impact on your business and will free you up so that you can go and, and put your energy, um, to where you can make more impact and then keep going from there. I don't think there's any magic answer for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Another question is about your support system as you are growing and still uh, with Peace Tree. Who were some or are some of your biggest mentors and what kind of resources did you use? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm kind of an independent person. And so I probably haven't done that as well as I could. Uh, and I'm learning to be better about that. Um, you know, in the very beginning, I had my dad and Scott and, you know, we would bounce stuff back and forth. Um, on the business side, Joe is, you know, he's our brewer and I see him as a true partner in our business. And so we bounce things back and forth off of each other. 
Um, and then my current uh, fiance partner, he's a financial advisor and has some good you know, background and business experience. And so I see him as kind of an informal mentor. We talk about business a lot. We have a couple of other businesses on the side. Um, so that's always really helpful. Um, but as far as like formal mentors and those sorts of things, I just had not been really great about that. Part of it's just finding the time to like spend with people. Um, but I think, you know, again, kind of the same way you're talking about staffing. I look at it also my own personal development of what holes do I have as a person and as a leader? And then who do I need to go talk to, to learn more about that, to figure out how to make it better. Um, one of them, you know, like our distributors, um, you know, obviously I hire good attorneys and good accountants and those sorts of things. Um, and then just recently I signed on with a sales consultant who can help me. Um, and next week I start with actually my own coach who's going to help me kind of uh, figure out long-term goals and, and run our business. It looks like I had some camera issue. Um, All right. I was still here, still listening. <laughs> awesome. um, all right. So what are a couple of things that you're looking forward to with Peace Tree? You know, right now, um, I am I am really si excited. We've got uh, a new salesperson that started this week. And I, again, like with the sales consultants, I think we're really poised well to get out and have some growth on the sales side. Um, our product lineup is awesome this year. We've got uh, cans that we rolled out last year in the middle of a pandemic. So it was a little hard to like really get the full push behind those. Um, but then we're adding the, the fourth can this year, the, the Lake Loop. Um, and we finally have 12 packs, which we've been wanting to do for a long time. So um, I'm just really looking forward to the fact that we've got, I think our best product lineup we've ever had. I might say that every year, but I do think we grow and change and evolve and it, and it does get better. Um, and then I think I'm also just really looking forward to, um, I think I'm really looking forward to seeing our team develop too. Like I said, we've been on the EOS and traction for a couple, couple, three years. Um, and I think we're finally to that point where people are really digging in and taking ownership of their own little areas and sections. And I, I expect that we'll see a lot of growth individually from, from each of our team members as we rebuild, you know, I mean, honestly, we just have to kind of rebuild a little bit from last year and set that foundation. And I, I think we're poised for a lot of good things coming forward. I can't wait to see all of those things come to fruition. Um, and I'm very, very happy for you and your team. So what is the one final thing that you'd love to give advice to the entrepreneurs listening to this now or in the future? Yeah, um, I think, you know, one thing that uh, has always come back to me over and over and over again, uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough, I will put a plug in for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. I was in that last year. Um, also during the pandemic, which was perfect. It was a lot of support. But one thing they really talked about um, success or failure of entrepreneurs really comes down to tenacity. And do you have the ability to roll your sleeves up? Um, do you have the ability to just stick with it? Do you have the ability to just keep working at it? Um, and, you know, if you if you don't have some of the other things, if you, you know, that we talked a little bit before about, you know, self-doubt and there's a ton of it, you know, you always think you're not good enough or you're not big enough or you don't have enough money, but tenacity can overcome all of that. If you just keep working at it, um, you're going to swing and miss, you're going to have failures, but just, you know, learn from it and then just keep coming back at it. And if, if you can't have anything else, uh, just be tenacious. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Megan, thank you for your time today. Uh, I know that you are busy and I know that you're on sales calls and deliveries today. So <laughs> I thank am. you for making the time um, to spend it with us and kind of helping entrepreneurs kind of rekindle that spirit of theirs. Um, I would like to personally plug in the Iowa Center really quick. Um, yes. So as we head into the weekend, um, not only should you go visit Peace Tree Brewing, but I also want to invite all of you to visit the Iowa Center website. We have a lot of incredible programs starting this month and May designed for the small business owner. I wanna give a quick shout out to our financially savvy program that is built to increase your awareness of best practices for financial management. 
I can seriously go on and on about our other programs, but I'm going to pass the torch onto all of you to visit our site today and see for yourself. Um, Megan, one last question. What is your favorite peace tree brewery, brewery drink? Gosh, I mean, today is Lake Loop. Uh, we opened up those cans that came out and we're just really excited about them. But I will tell you, it probably changes every time somebody asks me uh, yeah. with whatever is new. But I tend to, I tend to uh, gravitate toward the sours and the IPAs. Awesome. Okay, thank you for your time. I hope to see you around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, come visit anytime and keep up the great work. You guys are doing a lot of wonderful things at the Iowa Center. So appreciate it. Thank you so much, Megan. Have a great weekend. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.